Good morning. Um, today, Wednesday, January 12th, we're coming to you from Mitch's Wet Side Bagels in Coral Springs, Florida, which is at the heart of District 3, the district that I'm privileged to represent. And by the way, before I go any further, um, well, uh, Mitch's Bagels is at the corner of Heron Bay Boulevard and Knob Hill Road. Yeah. yeah, well, because she's Coral Springs Drive here in Coral Springs. It would be, it would be, Pun it would be Knob Hill. 5906 <laughs> South uh, Coral Springs Road. It's called Road. the Sawgrass Center Publix. And this is my favorite bagel place in all of, I think, all of the county. This is my the egg favorite salad's bagel. very good, too. And Mitch's tuna fish is absolutely to die for. And the coffee is great. So if you, I'm usually here on Fridays, by the way, at 11.30, right after I get my nails done. Okay. I'll come okay. here for lunch. <laughs> after I get mine done, I'll come in, too. <laughs> so you could see me. I don't wear makeup on Fridays, usually, so you probably wouldn't recognize me. Anyway, this is the third in a series of Coffee with Stacy. As you know, I'm the Broward County Commission for District 3. And we've been doing county employees who come and talked about things at the county last uh, last week or two weeks ago we had Chris Walton who's the director of transit and we were going to do that again this week this Wednesday but um, because of the events on Saturday in Tucson with the shootings of ten, was it 10 people I think um, six, six dead, dead and, uh, and over and a dozen wounded and yeah. critically and seriously injured um, I thought that the topic this morning might just be a general conversation about civility and government and the media and you know we'll see where it goes um, this morning my guest is Robert Watson who's a professor at Lynn University author media commentator all-around good guy a father a father <laughs> the most important thing of all husband, husband <laughs> parent voter um, motor, but not in this county I no don't think. no we live in Palm Beach, Beach County. Yeah. okay well things can get pretty nasty there too they I remember can. the 2000 election with Teresa Lepore sure they with hanging chads <laughs> dangling pregnant <laughs> dimple <laughs> chads and butterfly, butterfly ballots ballot. the new lexicon of voting right? <laughs> that's right and um, I will have a bag of hanging chads from the 2000 okay election. oh wow well. um, get them on eBay <laughs> you actually can get them on eBay I'm sure I have a friend who named his kid Chad after the oh, it, he was born after the 2000 election <laughs> Democrat of course better than dimple chad <laughs> <laughs> pregnant chad, pregnant chad. <laughs> oh, anyway <laughs> We're going to talk this morning about the events on Saturday and how you, what, what you think brought about it, brought about the events. What you think, why, why it happened, maybe why it hasn't happened more often. Okay. Um, well, you know, I, I would not make the causal link that the that the venomous tone of politics today or the lack of civility today was directly the result of the shooting. We don't know why. The guy appears to be very disturbed. However, I would say that I think. Perhaps the greatest challenge facing us today politically, even more so than I think Afghanistan and Iraq, more so than the budget and trade deficits, is our incivility. Because we've got to be able to sit down, break bread together, and work together before we can solve the complicated calculus that is Afghanistan, uh, that, that is our budget deficit. And this incivility, in my opinion, is worse today than any time since the Civil War. Not even the 1960s, I'd go back to the 1860s. Now, on the other hand, uh, and we can talk a lot about examples of the incivility, but Americans kind of have this false view that we have somehow, unlike much of the world, uh, not been plagued by internal political violence. But that's simply not true. Even during the founding, you had Shays Rebellion, the Whiskey Rebellion, we've had multiple incidences of in internal political violence, the KKK, the Oklahoma City bombing by Timothy McVeigh in the 90s, a decade ago, Capitol Police shooting, where a couple of Capitol Police officers were shot. The Civil Rights Movement marchers encountered a lot of uh, attacks, a lot of incivility. Four American presidents have been assassinated, uh, uh, Lincoln, Garfield, McKinley, and Kennedy. Uh, a number of attempted assassinations. Reagan was shot in 81. In uh, 1954, a group of Puerto Rican nationalists over politics uh, shot up the Capitol building and, and wounded several, five people. Just before that, they tried to kill Harry Truman and killed one of his security guards. Um, we've had, uh, in fact, the United States Capitol building was bombed three times in the 20th century. In 1915, there was a German sympathizer who was angry with us for what we were, our view in World War I, who bombed the Capitol building. In 1971, the Weather Underground, ironically enough, a left wing, wing a terror group, bombed the Capitol because of our war in Vietnam. And in 1983, another domestic terrorist group did the same thing in opposition to Reagan's war in Grenada. Now, most of these attacks were just, uh, you know, 
sort of like a random deranged person or a crazy terror group. And not a lot of people were killed. No one was killed in those three bombings, for example. So what I think is so remarkable today, one is, is not very many members of Congress or the legislature have ever been targeted. Uh, number two, Representative Giffords is the consummate, uh, civil, kind, moderate, non-offensive. She, if she would be the last person in Congress that you would target. Uh, and number three, though, I do think that the tone of politics coming out of a lot of talking heads in the media and and, and coming from the right wing in the Tea Party uh, is really pouring blood into the waters. We all have heard about Sarah Palin putting Sarah Palin on her website putting targets and bullseyes over Giffords in Arizona. Gifford's uh, opponent in the general election, a guy named Jesse Kelly, who's a Tea Party candidate, said let's target her and let's help remove her. He was using language like that. And he also had fundraisers where he would dress up in camouflage and you could shoot an M16 with the guy, which is just... I don't mean to laugh. I just, I mean, you know, coming from South Florida, that's just, that would be unheard of in South Florida. Now, uh, North Florida, it very, well, it very well may Very play. well may be, but you know, around the country, this idea that uh, you know, people love their guns more than they seem to love their kids' health care because they won't get out to vote over getting their kids affordable, accessible health care, but they'll get out to vote if there's even the perception that someone might limit the size of the clip they have. So this tone, uh, I think, is absolutely... Sharon Angle in Nevada, the Tea Party candidate, uh, said that if she doesn't get what she wants and her supporters don't get what they want, they could resort to Second Amendment remedies, referring to... That's, that's an inaccurate and irresponsible reading of the founders. The founders did not say you have the right to own and bear a gun because anytime you're angry you can shoot someone up. Uh, they would be morally outraged o o over that. Well, and you know, there's a whole other gun discussion to be had about how... And we're beginning to have it, well, fortunately. Well, but he, th this guy, um, the shooter in Tucson, got the gun legally, apparently, even though he had a record of some kind. He obtained the gun and, legally. And a month later, he bought the bullets. And so, a, a clip of 31 or something like that? But a three-day like waiting that? period yeah. wouldn't have mattered in this case right. because he waited 30 days right. or more to right. shoot. So right. that pulling off period that we all talk about, you know, that those of us who are, who are, who are um, support gun safety, in this case, didn't would have mattered. Probably because, wouldn't have done it. And, and, and I think that, that while the right bears some responsibility, I think the left bears some responsibility, too. I think too. they both do. I think on both sides, there's rhetoric. Now, it may not be as inflamed on the left. I mean, I don't see Rachel Maddow talking about taking people taking out. Taking people out. But, but, Keith Olbermann does do some pretty heated yeah. rhetoric. He and, called Bush a fascist at one point, and, you know, which I think was absolutely irresponsible. Right. Yeah. And, and that responsibility from the media on both sides, I agree. which, by the way, force elected officials to choose sides. Sure, and, sure. And someone who, I mean, I, I'm, I'm center left. I'm very liberal socially. I'm fiscally conservative. I think that's the new mantra for right. Democrats. Just, you know, center left. Yeah. But it's very hard to say. Yeah. I mean, when I was in Tallahassee, I walked in as a moderate and left flaming left-wing liberal because of what the Republicans would make us vote for. Right. You know, I can't vote for abortion. I can't vote for abortion restrictions. Right. Um, I can't vote for closing the courthouse doors for people who are injured. So it's forced. I think right. the media is feeding it. Right. No, I, I think so, too. Uh, the media bears some responsibility, and for a number of reasons. On one hand, it's a for-profit entity. Let's not forget, at the end, end analysis, whether it's a TV station, radio, or newspaper, they exist to make money or make money for the stockholders. And it's profitable to, uh, to sink to the lowest denominator. It's become profitable to uh, sell mud. The same reason why the public slows down and rubbernecks whenever we're passing a wreck. We, we, we like the mud. Reality TV shows are, are dominating today. We like the scandal. If you have an evening news story and you're sitting with your remote control and it's about interest rates, or another evening news story that a young girl was seen leaving Bill Clinton's house, everybody's going to click to the other one. And that drives advertising dollars, which is what makes the media. Also, I think the other impact is this notion of the social media and the soft media that Today we have thousands of channels on the radio, uh, countless websites, YouTube, MySpace, Twitter, Twitter Flickr, uh, and, and you know what? 99% uh, of it is not edited, it's not vetted, it's not peer-reviewed, it's not refereed, it's baloney. And yet people believe it and they're forwarding it, and it's also instantaneous and it goes universal, which means that anyone, no matter how malicious or malinformed, has a pulpit today. Absolutely. All you have to do, you post it and it goes worldwide, and, in seconds. And we've lost our sense of critical thinking. People are reading this enough and are beginning to believe some of this madness. You can, you, and 
libel and slander laws virtually don't exist. You, you can just spout off and hide behind the First Amendment. Oh, or, uh, or hide behind anonymity in general. Absolutely. With, with the internet these days. I mean, you can put anything you want and you don't have to put your name on it. Right. And it's, it, it's, it's, it's creating this toxic environment where I believe much of the media has become the adversarial media. Aha, gotcha is the mantra now for reporting. Uh, and, and you as a public official know that you, you might do 99 things uh, and you might have a 30-minute interview, but the one thing that you say or do that might be misconstrued as being a wee bit irresponsible, that's what you're quoted on. But, but this is not necessarily new. I mean, you're a professor of American history and American politics. You know that, and, 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 and I'm, you know, I, I love this. You were a history, history major. I am a history major, and I, and I you know, the, the, the books that I had to read in college, I'm now reading for fun, right. which either makes me... Now, we all do that, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but... And in it, hiding behind fake names is not. Um, sure. Who, who was it that, that, that wrote it? Well, Publius, was it? Publius. It Publius. was uh, Hamilton, Madison, and John Jay, the Federalist Papers, because if they if they revealed their name, especially Hamilton, who either loved or hated Hamilton, uh, Madison and Jay weren't nearly as controversial, it would have undermined a lot of what he did by, by doing that. So, no, it's, it's not new. The press has always been, in fact, uh, if you go back to the founding period, it was very common for our politicians to pay reporters. Thomas Jefferson kept reporters and actually had newspapers that he paid to keep them open to write against his opponents like Washington, Madison, Adams. Uh, and, and a good story, there was a, a drunk Scottish reporter named James T. Callender who was kicked out of Scotland for writing mud on the leaders there. He comes and opens up a paper in Richmond called the Richmond Reporter and he was paid by Jefferson to write mud on Hamilton and everyone. What happens under the Alien and Sedition Acts under John Adams, and I'm, I'm sorry if all your viewers have just tuned off because I'm talking I'm about it, such history. You guys, but you guys can now pause it or... Pause it, fast or, or forward in five minutes to catch Stacy. Uh, <laughs> just, just skip the professor. You want to get back to her in a minute. No, no. But, uh, I, or just, sorry, just look at Stacy and, and, and turn the mute, mute press mute. Um, which my students always want to do. But no, this is a delicious story. You'll like it. Uh, uh, Calendar is paid by Hamil Jefferson to write mud on Hamilton. Calendar's dishing the worst mud, even calls George Washington a wartime profiteer. Under the Alien and Sedition Acts of John Adams, when he attacks Adams, Calendar's thrown in jail. So he tells uh, Jefferson, get me out of jail, I want to live at Monticello, I want money from you. Jefferson says no, so he goes to work for the other side. Hamilton pays him, and in 1802, which is Jefferson's second year in office, a year after Calendar gets out of jail, Calendar's the one that breaks the story of the biracial slave mistress, Sally Hemings, uh, whom he called the African Venus, uh, Dusky Sally. He writes the story against Jefferson, so it was very common uh, that, that Washington and the Federalists and Jefferson and the Anti-Federalists all paid newspapers and kept reporters. So in a way, the more the things change, the more, the more, this, more they stay the same. So what's the, what's the, since it's been part of American political history to go after your opponent, to target your opponent, to crush your opponent, to kill your opponent, enemy, yeah. enemy these days. And back then too, Jefferson and Adams were yeah. enemies. They wouldn't yeah. consider themselves adversaries. Couldn't, so yeah, they, 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 they fought. Yeah, right. um, what's the difference? The difference is multiple. One, let's take Adams and Jefferson. Those two had periods where they didn't speak. Uh, in fact, one, uh, Abigail Adams, despite being a bit of a prude, had a wee bit of hots for Jefferson. I, I read that. Yeah, and I read that. <laughs> at one point, Jefferson writes Adams a letter when they weren't speaking and Jefferson said, Excuse me, Adams writes Jefferson a letter, and Adams says to Jefferson, quote unquote, stop writing to my wife. Uh, but, uh, but here's the deal. When, when it came to statesmanship and serious issues, they sat down and broke bread together, and they worked together. Today, the Democrats and Republicans don't know one another, and no Republican would be caught dead meeting with any Democratic leader or going over to the White House. That's the difference. My political hero is Harry Truman. And Harry Truman is wrongly portrayed as the sort of partisan, contrary Missouri mule. And the fact of the matter was Truman always sitting around his, sitting around his poker table, you know, drinking bourbon and playing poker. Uh, Art Vandenberg, the Republican from Michigan, Truman always had Republicans sitting around. Truman reached across the aisle, whether it was the Marshall Plan, whether it was the creation of NATO, all these momentous issues, and folks worked together. So today, we lack the type of leaders who will work together, and, and they have the pressures to not do it. Take Obama, for example, on this is issue of the tax compromise in December. I don't like to compromise, but I think he had no choice. For example, the Democrats were in one end zone, Republicans in the other end zone, was I think the analogy I used. Democrats said, you know, we want 
tax breaks for people, families making under 250 grand. Republicans said no, we want them for people over 250 grand. Democrats want an extension of unemployment comp. Republicans say no, they want $5 million of state tax benefits, tax free. The Democrats say no. They're in either end zone. Obama finds the 50 yard line. And except for Grover Cleveland and the silver issue in the late 1800s, there's no example, I think, in American history where a president, when, when both sides were at an impasse, when they found the 50-yard line, they were always heralded as a statesman. Everybody hates Obama for doing what everybody was applauded for before. So we, the public, are partly responsible. And I think the third difference is this. Today, there's just so many media outlets, just absolutely so media, so many of them, that unlike 70 years ago when you had Father Charles Coughlin, this anti-Semitic, xenophobic, jingoistic radio priest. It was one guy, one radio. Today you've got hundreds of these people. It's just so much that the information superhighway has become the misinformation superhighway. And it's so loud, the screaming, the tone, to even get heard, you, know, you and I have to it? be yelling. How do you fix it? Well, the, 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 it rests with we the people. We have to reject this kind of vitriolic, uh, venomous tone coming out of Palin and Angle and Limbaugh and Beck and these people. But we also have to realize that Rachel Maddow and, 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 and Oberman and, 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 and these guys on the left, they cherry pick the facts as well. We've got to turn it off. We've got to demand better. We have to be critical thinkers. We have to realize that just because you read something on the email or because you get a, see something on YouTube or, or you get a 120 character tweet on Twitter doesn't make it true. Uh, and we, and you know, what our mothers told us when we were little, count to ten before you make a rush decision. Uh, it's that important. The founders said we have to pour a little cool cream in our hot coffee so we don't burn our lip. Let's pour a little cool cream in it and realize that words like compromise and cooperation and consensus, this is what makes our political system work. It's like, like marriage, it's what makes it work. Today, compromise is a bad word. We have to reject these politicians like the Tea Party that are saying we refuse to ever compromise. Okay, thanks. I want to thank Dr. Dr. Watson for being here with me this morning. Thank My you pleasure. very much. We're going um, to, well, after I wrap this up, we're going to talk some more American history. But I want to remind everybody that we're at Westside Bagels on the corner of Knob Hill and Heron Bay Boulevard in Coral Springs. Um, also, you can reach me at sritter at broward.org or 954-357-7003. Yesterday at the county commission meeting, the county talked about, um, the commissioners talked about whether or not we should install some kind of security system at the government center. Uh, metal detectors or armed guards or wand, wanding of, of uh, people who come. And I'd like to know what you think about that. Um, please let me know. I'm, I'm interested to hear what the constituents have to say about whether or not you think we should beef up security. Or if you don't know what the security is at the government center, I'd be happy to talk to you about it. Again, S. Ritter at Broward.org. 954-357-7003. We'll see you next month on, what is this, the third Wednesday? It's the third Wednesday? You're asking a professor. <laughs> I don't know what year it is. You're I, not even, you're not I'm even back in 1802. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, we're going to go back, but I couldn't vote in 1802. Yeah, you and I, I wouldn't be sitting here talking in 1802. You and I are so young, we couldn't vote in 1999. So. That, that's, that is not true, by the way. Uh, I'm, we're I'm close. perfectly honest we're to close. tell you. <laughs> so, um, Come, come meet with me next, uh, next uh, whatever the third Wednesday in February is at Westside Bagels, and um, we'll see you. Thanks, thanks for watching. Thank thanks you. again, Dr. Watson. My pleasure.